Hi, Paul Thompson here. Going to talk about developing your material today, um, but it's going to be mainly kind of talky. We'll dive into the nitty gritty and start looking at sessions and stuff in the next video. But for this one, I just want to talk about the, the bit between having all your fragments ready and then uh, actually sitting down at the door and putting stuff down. So what is that kind of thinking period or that kind of development period primarily about? There's obviously the uh, gathering together of the various different bits. So you've got a variety of different ideas and you need to try and piece them together. There's also extending material. So let's say you have a really great idea, but in its kind of current form, it's about a minute and a half long. Um, you're probably going to want to add some stuff to it. And the trick here is to try different ideas, but not to rule anything out immediately. You have to allow for ideas to graft into the existing tree, I was going to say, the existing idea, the existing song. Um, before you, it's very easy to just kind of bin things off straight away without allowing them time to develop and kind of sink in. Um, almost like grafting plants together, you have to allow them to grow together first. And it might turn out that something is just totally wrong, but but you never know. There's There's a variety of different kind of structures you know, you've got kind of um, ABC, ABA, ABACA. All of these things you can think about when you're putting the kind of running order of your ideas together and see whether if you're writing something in a traditional song structure or maybe it's a single development that starts in a place, goes through and then ends in a slightly different place. And there's a couple of pieces like that on, on the record. In fact, one of them I'll, I'll put a little preview of at the end of this video. One of the things that you have to think about is what is the band? And this could be for the whole project or it could be just it could be completely different track by track. When we're writing for media, we tend to have an overall uh, band that you'll settle on as you're developing your ideas for the TV show or the game or whatever it is. And that then stays kind of set because you don't want to keep distracting the viewer um, by suddenly changing the band all the time because that's going to get pretty jarring. In the same way as which if another collaborator, for example, the, the colorist, were to start off with one kind of color palette and then just keep changing the color palette, you'd be sitting there going, what is going on? So we have to think about that. When you're putting together a project like an album, though, you can be a lot more adventurous and you can make it really diverse across the whole body of work because the thing that glues it together and the focus is the fact that it's your music. Um, and that's the thing that holds it together. And people will hear a kind of uh, not, not necessarily a similarity between the tracks in the style, but they'll hear a voice behind the things that you're kind of dressing your ideas with. So, I would say you can be a lot more adventurous when you're making something like an album. Um, and you might have a stylistic overall uh, kind of overarching idea. But then within that, you can you can kind of change up from track to track. You know, what is the bass drum sound in this track? Or, you know, one one track I, uh, on the last album I made had six bass drums. So you might find that there are things that you layer together, but there's little things that you use for ghost notes and stuff like that. And that body of sounds for one track might be totally different from the body of sounds for the next track. Um, are you going to use things like live bass? Are you going to, um, you know, use a, a synth bass? Are you going to have a live feel to the track so it's a lot less edited or do you want it to be incredibly precise so that you're going in and really tightening everything up and this can apply to all kinds of stuff so we'll get into that and I'll show you some uh, of the ways that I've edited tracks um, in a couple of videos time when we're actually diving into some of the examples but it's it's not one thing or the other so it's not like either it's like a kind of electro track which is super tight to the grid and that's it. Or it's something a bit more classical and it's all over the place. You can go in and you can tighten up things where it feels appropriate or, you know, you can kind of create electronic music that feels really live. And, you know, it, it's not it's more about what is going to suit the character of the piece that you're writing. Now, the other thing that comes into this is like casting uh, the musicians and that can be 
that you're writing for a specific live player that you're going to get to play on your track. And these might be, they might be people that, you know, professionals or they might be your friends. You might really love the way that, you know, so-and-so plays the bass. And so you want to get them to play on it. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're kind of thinking, well, you know, um, what superstar musician is going to play this thing. It's more about finding the right player for the right part. Now, that also applies to virtual instruments. And I'll give you a quick example of that. Um, it's, I mean, it, it probably think this is blindingly obvious, but let's say there's a piano. Um, you've got a piano in the track. Well, you're going to play it yourself. You're going to use a virtual instrument. What piano are you going to use? These are the things that you should, don't, don't just reach for the first one or the one that you used last or your favorite. Try and think about what every, uh, the character of each one is going to bring to the track. For example, here is a one dynamic, very contextual, very, very simple uh, grand piano. You can see that the entire grand piano is less than 200 meg loaded and I've got two mics up. And that is, you know, this kind of... It's just back there. It's the thing that it does that kind of that kind of behind the orchestra splangy sort of thing. But that's not going to be great for, you know, doing this kind of. That doesn't work at all. OK, so what are we going to do? Well, you know, we've got all kinds of things that we can use. You might decide that you want to use something that really doesn't sound totally like a piano and it's like this. Or it might be something that you really want to feel like you're almost sat in a duvet underneath the lid of the piano. So the choice of player can mean the choice of the actual player, or it can mean the choice of the virtual player. And all of these things are incredibly important to giving the, the feel and the vibe of the track. And they're things that you should think about as you're writing, um, because it can help, it can push you, it intensify your music with, a, with real character. It can push you right into that area where stuff is, I don't know, my, a lot of my favorite music is because it's, there are things that I like. I like the feeling of ecstasy that you get from some pieces of music, but also it's character. You know, it's something that where you can hear that somebody has really thought about and crafted the sound world that you're, that you're uh, you know, that you're inhabiting when you're listening to it. Which takes us through to sound design. Sound design, again, in this kind of thing, incredibly important. We, we, uh, I've talked about this before about sound design and film scoring, and you know having that really interesting combination of uh, sound design where you could almost call it music design, where you don't really know whether the sounds that you're hearing are part of the a sound effects design or whether they're part of the music. If you can have that kind of blend together, then that can be incredibly powerful. And you've got, you've got you know, so much more opportunity to really go to town with this when you're making your own album, because you don't have to worry about whether your sound effects are going <laughs> to say sound effects, whether your sound design in your music is going to affect what people are looking at. Um, there's a whole storytelling aspect that you have to think about there. And are you going to clash with stuff that the actual effects people are doing and all of that kind of stuff. But here you can create you know, a world from the sound design. It could be anything from, you know, opening with the noise of a forest, opening with the noise of, you know, an underground station where the train has gone and, and you can just hear it going off into the distance. There's so much stuff that you can do with sound design um, to really bring character and to tell stories with your music. And that's where, you know, when we start to look at this kind of thing and we're making records is is like the absolute upper end of the kind of triple A um, 
movie or the kind of AAA video game where there is time to develop ideas and to really get very, very precise on on the music that you're writing. Um, and in some ways, almost, you know, you could, there's a corollary with zero budget projects that are going to just take as long as they take. So student films and things like that. You can be equally creative with those. But but when you've got away from that kind of deadline based stuff uh, where you really don't have too much freedom here, it's all about crafting um, as much detail and and putting as much thought into every single sound that you're using as possible because people are going to listen to this again and again and again. And so you want to, you know, you want to kind of make the music full of amazing little ideas that you hear maybe not on the first hearing but lots of little character sounds that are just kind of there that people won't notice straight away but then they'll hear that thing and they'll go oh I love that when that little synth line goes and you can't it's really quite quiet but I can just hear it going in that on that section um or you know it might be just the way that you link you know a, a couple of the drum sounds into the bass or into the transition to the next part of the music there's lots of little fun things um, that you can do. Uh, a great example of this, of these kind of really interesting ear wormy transitiony sounds, um, is if you listen to Greg Wells's production of The Greatest Showman. Um, if you listen to the album and just listen to all the detail and all the little things that are happening. You know, when you're transitioning from one part to another, from a, a verse to a chorus or a bridge or whatever, there's so much stuff in there. It's, it's amazingly rich sonic tapestry. And that's the kind of thing um, that I really love. And you can go from one extreme to the other. So you can have you can make a virtue of sparseness. Um, but you but when you've got something where it's a full track, you want to put lots of ear candy in so that people really um, enjoy repeated listenings. You've got to be a little bit more careful. The thing about re repeated listenings is that you'll hear mistakes. Um, now, there's a fine line to go between obliterating character and fixing things that just sound a bit wrong. <laughs> so you have to work out where that line is for a particular piece. But you don't want somebody to hear something jarring every single time they listen to the track. Because if someone's going to listen to a track 100 times, that is going to get seriously annoying. And it'll put them off and it'll take them out of the experience. So, so that's something where you have to work out your tolerance level for um, character versus mistakes. The music is the focus. You're not working around sound effects or dialogue or uh, subservient to a specific you know, set of cuts or anything like that. It really can be your, your, um, your absolute focus is simply that somebody could sit and close their eyes and be taken up into your world. Um, so at some point you can ask yourself in a certain track, do I need a hero instrument? Do I need a, a soloist? Um, and that will probably tend to direct you towards a live player. Um, there's so much that you get from collaboration with, with live musicians. Uh, and that can, you know, it's always the first thing that I think of if I think, right, I really want this piece to sing out. I want it to... There's a definite melody that is the hero of this track and I want people to just immediately connect with it. Having another human being putting all of their emotion, their love, their passion into the performance of your, your melody um, is the most direct way to kind of mainline into uh, somebody's brain and really take over their, their emotional reaction to your music. And I guess the last thing before I kind of leave you with a little piece which exemplifies that where it was um, the transformation from how I was hearing it with, with my, uh, you know, with my staff pad version even sounding quite nice. And when the players actually sat and played it and especially Jonathan the soloist was just uh, made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I'll give you, I'll, I'll play you a little clip of that in a minute. But that takes me just to the final thing, which is that you, the a massive part of this process is refinement. And you have the opportunity to keep refining your work. And I don't mean, I don't mean refine it into non-existence. 
I mean by refining it, I mean finding the essence and magnifying that. And it might be finding some imperfections in there and really cranking them up so that, you know, whether it's that breath sound or the keys or the chair creak or something like that, finding those kind of moments of kind of beauty and and something kind of real and really kind of amplifying that stuff and refining the way that the ideas work and, you know, really, really concentrating and focusing on are you getting the best out of the sound, whether it's like, you know, a snare drum or a bass drum. Are you getting the character, full character of every single element of this track um, and maximizing it? So um, very talky, a lot of kind of ideas, uh, but we're going to put those into practice in the next one. We're going to I'm going to show you about how I set up a, a session. Um, what are the kind of basic requirements for that? What do I always do? And what are the ways that you can really streamline the process, but also create the most inspirational environment for you when you're the performer to perform into? Um, so we'll look at that next time. But for now, I'm going to leave you with a little clip of one of the pieces called Melancholy um, with the beautiful playing uh, of Jonathan Morton and the incredible string players uh, that Hilary Skews contracted for me. So enjoy this and I'll see you on the next one.